uh, former head of counterterrorism at the MOD and a commander uh, in the Elite Parachute Regiment. Good afternoon to you, Chip. Good afternoon, Julia. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, you know, I talk a good game, but fundamentally, I'm an armchair general, never actually been there. I like to think, in the event of war, certainly to defend a territory, we're going to defend my family, my, my fellow uh, uh, nation, uh, you know, livers, I, that I would be willing uh, to, to, uh, to fight and to lay down my life, because people have done that before for me to lay, live the life I lead. But we're amazed, actually, by how many people are saying, no, I wouldn't fight for this country, wouldn't fight for this government, We've been left behind. I certainly wouldn't go to one of our allies' uh, uh, countries and fight on the Eastern Europe or, or anywhere else because I just I, I, I don't think it's worth it. What do you make of that reaction? Well, it depends what you define by the vital interests of the UK. And we've been terribly bad in the last 20 years or so at defining what those vital interests are. Now, I would suspect that if we were invaded, and that's a you know, very low possibility, that people would take a different thing. I suspect people would uh, say that it's terrible if, for example, uh, the subsurface uh, infrastructure in the North Sea were uh, hit by the Russians and the gas and the energy to the UK and the internet uh, architecture were broken and that no one could go on TikTok. I think people would say <laughs> that's outrageous and we'd, we'd have to fight. So geography matters. Uh, the interest matters, the vital interest. So, for example, at the moment, I would say that, for example, the Red Sea is of vital interest to the UK and the international community because the free flow of trade and navigation is something which is, is worthwhile for the whole international community. That's why, for example, in that instance, UN Security Council Resolution 2722 was not vetoed by China and Russia. People want that to happen. Uh, I think the we wouldn't go and fight in Eastern Europe thing is slightly dangerous because one of the um, one of the things which is good at the moment is that NATO is a collective organization. It's got stronger and with more purpose because of the uh, invasion of Ukraine with the addition of Finland with another 280,000 people making it the 31st member and Sweden soon to join the 32nd member. So deterrence and defence matters, collective security matters, so that you don't have to go to fight and yeah. fight. And In that, the UK sense, it's not the army which is the most important, it's the Air Force and the Navy. Yeah, indeed. And this is the thing I'm fascinated by, you know, the usual suspects on the Labour benches, the, uh, the uh, you know, the, the virtue signalling Corbynistas, how awful it is that, you know, we're, uh, British Army and the US are, are, are attacking Houthi missile, Houthi rebels uh, who are firing missiles at the Red Sea, as if, as if protecting commercial shipping in the Red Sea isn't part of our national interest. And, of course, America's as well, both seafaring nations relying on international trade. Uh, and again, not just for consumer goods, but for our safety as well. And that's the thing, isn't it? Because this is what happened you know, with Ukraine. And it's also what's happened in the past, you know, the threats to, to Finland as well. And that's what the Baltic countries and Poland all fear as well. Often it isn't just, you know, tanks rolling in and a really obvious signal, as we saw with eastern Ukraine in the Donbass region, uh, you know, ahead of 2014. We, you know, we had, you know, the Russian military build up they weren't in uniforms. It wasn't officially the Russian army. There are ways of these things happening on territory that is land, but on sea, cutting off our supplies, blockades, um, cutting our, 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 you know, our electricity, our power. These things that happen. And people say, well, it's not actually an invasion, but, but it is an act of war. Um, do you think that we've all got a bit soft? Have we all forgotten? Because we're in a couple of generations now, two or three generations, who've never had to experience real war. Yes. In my time, lifetime, you know, we've had Gulf War, we've had the uh, Falklands War, but these are, they're far away, and unless you are either a, a fighting man or woman or a close member of their family, you haven't had to deal with the impact of that in the way that people did in the First and Second World Wars. Do you think that we've just got soft and we just don't really understand that you do have to stand well, think, up? Yeah, I think people have been living under the rubric of the long peace, so it's the misunderstanding and ignorance really of geostrategy and geopolitics, which is the main thing, not the fact we've either gone soft or whatever, but uh, it's really that if, you, if you're not soft, you're hard, and hard power is a reality at the moment. We've seen that in Europe. One of the things that I like to quote is General Mark Milley, who was the outgoing chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in America in 2017 said, and this is of course before the invasion of Ukraine, that there are a number of myths about war that we need to let go 
The first one he said is that wars will be short. They might not, was his rubric to that. And this is really what Patrick Saunders has said, really. He hasn't said, let's introduce conscription. No. He said, regular armies start wars, citizen armies uh, win them. The second thing Milley said was that armies fight wars. They don't. Nations fight wars. And he's really trying to get a conversation there between uh, the military and society as to how we go to uh, a, pl a place where we have this sort of strategy bridge between the nation and the military. Because the third thing he said is that armies are easy to create, they're not. Yeah. And that's what we need to get to. So two of these concepts which have been missing in the last 10 to 20 years are the first concept of regeneration, that's making sure your equipment, manning levels, stock levels, and, it, and uh, infrastructure, including the industrial infrastructure, is there to support the force and, in being. And it is, and we know one, that. <laughs> Yeah, and the second one is reconstitution, which is the expansion of the force. Yeah. So it's that debate but okay, but which let's needs say, to be Let's get down to specifics. We haven't got many ships. We haven't got many jets. Uh, we haven't got many tanks. Uh, we're constantly equipping to fight the last war. So, we're all, so we'd be fine to fight a war in the desert now. Well done. Well, you know, the, uh, Ukraine isn't a desert. Um, uh, we, we, we constantly live like that. Procurement is massively... I mean, it's hugely slow. It's hugely complicated. We often end up with with stuff that doesn't work, doesn't function. We pay three times as much for it. It takes years and years to come. And we've only got an army of seven... Well, an entire military of, of 70,000. I mean, you, you know, you, we've got, you've got seats spare in Wembley Stadium at that point. That's... You know, that is not enough of a military capability. Yes, we've got loads of money going on nuclear weapons, but the whole point of nuclear weapons is your willingness to use them but never having to use them. But we know... We, we watch what's happened in the last 10, 20, 30 years. We know we need to have a fighting force that is able to protect our allies and us, and we don't have it. But why don't we? Where's the lack of political will? Where's that coming from? Well, the reality is that we have the sixth largest defence budget in the world. It's what that defence bu oh, budget buys you, money. which is the issue. We spend a lot of money, but it doesn't really produce very much. But it, but it must be uh, said against the NATO context. There are very few occasions where we're likely to be uh, campaigning by ourselves. And most of the uh, occasions that we've been campaigning in the last 30 years were a junior partner to America. One of the most important things to do is to make sure that the transatlantic bridge between America and the US and NATO, European NATO, is maintained. But in terms of pure spending, NATO, European NATO, outspends uh, Russia by about four times. It's what the plans, dispositions and capabilities within yeah. NATO are, which is more important. Part of the uh, problem is the sort of uh, tension really between Patrick Saunders, his speech today as uh, head of the army and chief of defence staff. We, the chief of defence staff has said that we're an expeditionary, uh, always been an expeditionary force rather than a continental force, and that our operational advantage comes not from mass, but from disproportionate effect. Now, what he means by that, I'm not sure. But people like me, particularly because of uh, Ukraine, would say that mass still matters. There's only one country which can really afford exotic capabilities in the fine degree, and that is America. Uh, that's where we need to be part of an alliance because we can't be strong everywhere. No. We try and be strong everywhere, we end up being weak everywhere. No, indeed, and there are lots of countries like Germany that, frankly, lived off that, uh, you know, the peace dividend and haven't been making contribution over the years. They're now bucking their ideas up. Certainly countries like Poland, who've lived with the reality of being invaded over the last century a number of times, a number of different nation-states, uh, that, uh, that, that they understand that, which is why they've always kept up to their... Uh, their, their percentage of GDP required under NATO, which many other countries haven't. I mean, Donald Trump was right to call that out, wasn't he? Um, in terms of what happens next, though, do you think that we are going to have uh, an increase in defence spending? Do you think, again, when times are hard, people don't want to pay more tax, you can't borrow more, uh, other public services failing, do you think there is now an, an understanding within government we are in very, very dangerous very uncertain times, we need to spend more on defence, we need to recruit more, and we need to be focusing on that right now? I think the GDP uh, figure is strategically illiterate. It means nothing. You need to define the capability you, right. you, you need. So the reason I say that, for example, at the end of the Cold War, our GDP spent on defence was 3.8%. In 1990, when we went to the Gulf War, technically on paper, we had three armoured divisions in Germany. We had to absolutely strip two of those to sustain and make available one armoured division. So just having yeah. pure numbers can give you a pyrrhic capability 
unless there is availability and sustainability and that costs a lot of money but you need to define that just having numbers of troops is not a capability okay. a capability is really the sum of training equipment personnel yeah infrastructure it's, it's, and logistics I think the and summary sure of that, sustainable together. I think the summary of that, uh, Chip, is, is it's more complicated than that. Thank you. Major General Chip Chapman, I so appreciate you joining us. Uh, he's the former head of counterterrorism at the MED, but also a former commander in the elite parachute regiment.